Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. As I always say, it's really good to be with you. And it's always really good to be with my very close colleagues, Phoebe Francis. Hi, Phoebe. Hi, Graham and, and Mohammed. Nice to and, be here with you. And Mohammed, how are you? Hi, Graham and Phoebe. Hi from Bahrain. Hey, very good, very good. So this week, I would like us to talk about this question of course this is about what leaders are doing yes the question is is there a better way mm. so what is what is that what do i mean by that and why should leaders be asking that question or should they be asking the question so phoebe what, what's your response to my statement or question is there a better way that leaders might say that yeah, there is always better way, you know, Graham. Like when when we when we as uh, individuals think, and especially when, like here, we are three three members together, sharing ideas. And when 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 we listen to others, it actually creates uh, new ideas which emerge, and that that can be an inspiration. So I think there is always a better way when we listen, when we hear, when we see other perspectives. So I think, yes. You think yes. Mohammed, oh. what about you? What's your response to that question? Is there a better way? Um, it's my response to my daughter when she wants to buy something expensive. I say <laughs> to her in a leadership manner, is there a better way? But in fact, <laughs> deep, deep, deep inside, I mean, is there a cheaper way? <laughs> uh, but really, uh, leaders have to deal with the challenges and constraints which are on the um, constantly happening. Change is constant. So they need to deal with that. Maybe it's economic, maybe it's uh, organizational, maybe it's whatever. So they need to challenge the process in order to uh, adapt and continue. I think that there are many mm, managers, let's use that term for this particular part of the discussion, who resist change. No, no, that's the way it's always been done. Keep doing mm. it that way. Of course, uh, if that was the case, and I'm referring now to an example of in the Middle East, if that was the way, they would still be using camels to get from Abu Dhabi to Dubai. That's about a four-hour journey, four journey by camel, I'm told. Not that I've done it. But this is something that I've always been encouraging leaders at, at all levels. Is there a better way? Another way I sometimes put this is to say, what if? What if? What if we didn't do this? Well, well we've always done it. Yeah, but what if we didn't do it? Now, Muhammad you mentioned challenge the process. And this, of course, is the third practice in the leadership challenge. Challenge the process. I'll tell you a little secret. When the when Jim Cousins and Barry Posen were first putting the five practices together, don't tell anybody, all those years ago, they were going to put at the front the first practice challenge the process because of what they believe was the importance of this challenge the process it was going to be number one now then they look through it and say no no we really think that the first part should be the first practice should be modeled away we need to believe in the leader we need to believe in what he's doing but he needs to have credibility before anything else is going to apply so it became number one in the order of the five practices of exemplary leadership but challenge the process is so it, you know, the world wouldn't be what it is if we didn't challenge the process. Phoebe, what's 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 your comment on on that statement? Yeah, I I I think um, you know sometimes challenges find us, and sometimes we find challenges. So I think that way we we try to uh, experiment one, one aspect which which comes to my mind is you know i, I remember in my childhood my uh, family member one of my family member uh, was working in doha qatar and families waited for the letter which takes 
maybe one week or uh, two weeks to reach back to India when a message is posted. But now, you know, someone challenged the process. How can we communicate parallelly real time? Sure. So, you know, challenging the process always helps. And this also brings me a thought process. You know, sometimes um, in, in the uh, theatrical space, when we watch the movie, like Back to the Future, yeah. that is something coming to my mind. You know, how, how uh, we visit from one year to the other. And now we have, I have seen the flying cars, but now flying cars are a reality. Someone has challenged the process. There's one outside now. There's just a blue one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. the, the, the range of things and I and I think we've we'll just spent a little bit of time talking about some of the changes that we are living with which otherwise it wouldn't have happened let, let me tell you one so I've got a few stories on this I hate to bore you with this but here's one deal I was with a I won't name the, the the airline but it was a large airline in the Middle East with their maintenance senior people of the maintenance department like the head of safety for instance and we talked we talked about challenge the process when I brought that up in the workshop, challenge the process. By the way, I want every aircraft that's flying around the world every day, every time to fly perfectly and safely. Don't we all? Yes. Yeah. The aviation industry is very much focused on safety. So I talked about challenge the process. And one of the comments was, no, no, we can't. And I said, hang on, I, is there a chance that right now, now this goes back a little way, this particular example, there's a chance that there is a meeting somewhere saying, why don't we build one, a plane, out of plastic? Mm. A few years later, Boeing released or announced they're releasing the 787 Dreamliner. It's not built out of plastic, it's built out of composite material. The aviation industry is constantly challenging the process and looking for better ways. I was in a, doing a program for a bank some again some years ago in Dubai, and one of the senior people in the bank said, no, no, we can't challenge the process. We are a bank. Now, Phoebe, you and I have done a lot of work for the banking industry, right? The yeah. banking industry challenges the process every day. They have to challenge the process to overcome this fraud that's taking place and try and reduce the amount which is being taken from the economy worldwide of $192,000 per minute because of bank fraud. And the banks are looking for better ways of doing what they do. But even as customers, look what happened when they had the, had the pandemic. People couldn't go to a branch, and so it was much more online. I was really surprised when this senior bank him, oh, no, we can't, we can't. And he also said it's the same with healthcare. Give me a break. All the time, all the time, the medical professional looking for better ways to provide outcomes for their patients. Challenge. Of course. Of course. I can see uh, two uh, challenges in terms of challenging the process. And uh, so I see that, that we are dealing with two insecurities. Yeah. With change being inevitable, the leader is facing two insecurities, in fact, not one. Uh, the first obvious one is that the people, uh, he wants to challenge them, to challenge the process, like the employees, for example, or his team, are very comfortable with the status quo. They are uh, very much afraid of moving out of the comfort zone, of doing something they weren't used to, etc., so this is insecurity number one. The insecurity number two is when you as the leader lead that change, you won't be liked. And you have to step out of your comfort zone. You would rather say, okay, I'll go with the, with the, uh, with the group. I don't want to hurt anyone's feeling. I don't want to get into arguments. So these are two insecurities not only to convince them of the change, but to actually decide to go there. So I think I, I'm, I'm very sure that our episode will pinpoint that and how to help the leader in whatever change he wants to make. Yeah, so just drill this down a little bit further. Manage, why do you, just look at the, the, the statement that managers resist change. Not always, but let's just make that as a statement. Managers resist change. You, ind you ind indicated that. One of the reasons that they might yes. change is if someone at a 
a new member to the team, for instance, makes a suggestion about changing a process, what's the likely response to the manager from the manager? Not just we've always done it this way, but as you were indicating, he's likely to feel threatened by this new person who's come in and come up with an idea that's going to save money at the same yes. time. Yep. All of that. And and so the point of this really is that managers, leaders, sorry, I nearly said leaders who are managers should be encouraging people all the time to look for better ways. And he should be open to that. I I believe, and I say this so often in my workshops, that when we've finished a major, uh, mind, middle level, whatever, not just every job we do, but when we've finished a task, it might have taken a couple of weeks or, they might, or a couple of months or a couple of years. And we've got a successful outcome. I believe the leader, stroke manager, leader manager, should say to the team, guys, well done, great job. Then say, if we were to do it again tomorrow, what we do? What would we do differently? How could we do it yeah. better? Beautiful, Always beautiful. Learning, making mistakes along the way, but learning. Mm -hmm. We're learning from the mistakes. So even though it might be a wonderful idea, and I've used this as an, as an example in my workshops in the Middle East, I say I'm really pretty sure that when they finished the construction of the Burj Khalifa, which is a pretty amazing building, that there was a meeting with senior people, maybe even at different levels, saying, great job, guys. There was a few years of work and we got an amazing building. If we were to do it again tomorrow, what would we do differently? Or what did we learn? And they learned so much in that construction. We've got to be open to this and encourage yeah. people at all levels. Phoebe, you were going to say something. Yeah, so I, I, a story came to my mind. It was related to the operational process in, 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 a, in a bank. You know, the challenge the organization faced to us, there was a couple of account opening rejection uh, happening at the operational center. Now, uh, the, this created a bit of customer dissatisfaction. You know, the customers' accounts are not op opened on time. Salaries were not uh, salaries were unable to be credited. People were de get, getting delayed because their payment plans get stuck. So one one of the staff member came out. Uh, Phoebe, how can how can we explore this together? And that was an initiation of challenging the process. So uh, we, we identified in the diagnosis that, okay, there are sometimes some signature missing in the application form, some columns not uh, filled in appropriately. This leads to rejection. So imagine that out of 10 applications, uh, three get opened, seven get rejected. This, this makes the sales team to go back to get the sign signature from the customer, the courier, costs, the delay in account opening, the customer being unhappy in the process of onboarding. Yeah. And it, what, what we did was, uh, again, help, 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 with the help of one of the person is uh, sensitizing the sales team with a small two-hour session. What are the areas which you have to focus on? And after those interventions, what happened was the rejection came down heavily. That means more accounts open, more people were happy, and customers get their account opened on time. The salespeople were happy because their uh, time is now focused on new account opening. They get more incentives. And this, someone challenged the process. Why, what can we do differently? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah, it should be constant. Mohammed. I, yeah, I'm immediately reminded of Steve Jobs. Uh, when he said people won't uh, know what's best for them until they see it. Yeah. So let's go ahead, he says to the team, let's go ahead and invent. And then people won't see it when they see it and use it. They will notice that it's better. But before that, on the idea level, on the conceptual level, people will resist. If you throw something on the table in the meeting, of course, people will have so many questions and resistances. Yeah. But once they see the change and how the change is actually better and makes their life even better, productivity better, this is where a leader needs to take the team to that level of actually tangibly seeing the change. So I'm glad you mentioned Steve Jobs. You must have known. Actually, he didn't know. He didn't know. But I've got a Steve Jobs story, which I'll introduce now. 
Uh, you know, I just want to make one point. The leader in this instant who's coming up with new ideas, I think it's important that the le- not, not the leader, but the leader should be empowering leaders or leadership with everybody in the team, getting them to come up with ideas, getting them to be able to say, how about we do this or is there a better way of doing this? That They should be looking to, to make suggestions. And I have been in a situation where someone fairly, quite junior made a particular observation and the senior person said in the group, wow, I would never have thought of that. Right, so the yeah. point there is listen to what people are saying when you're at a senior level. So here we go. What have I got there? I, there is the apple on the back of the phone. There it is. There's my iPhone. So I don't know whether you know the story, and I don't know whether this is 100% true or not, but I have heard it told this way. Steve Jobs, who came up with the idea in Apple of producing the smartphone, the story. Who, who was the leader in mobile phones? At that stage, which company starts with N? Nokia. Yeah, yeah. All the mobile phones were Nokia's, right? Where is Nokia now? They're struggling. Okay, they're trying to get back. But mm. going back some years, when they were at the top of the tree, Steve Jobs said, "Apparently, I like the story, and I hope it's true." He said, "I want on my phone. I want to access the messages that are important." for me on my phone or the calls that have been made. I don't want to have to scroll through everything that came in in order and re- and delete it, delete, delete. I want to find the one that's really important. So why don't we develop a phone that does that and a whole lot of other things? Steve Jobs, according to the story, said this is the way we should be going with this. Here's, you know, here's another, there's, there's a gazillion stories like this. Some are quite simple. Let me share this one, which I think is fascinating, and it's simple. I'm afraid I don't know the exact um, numbers in this story, so but it still works. There was an area where they wanted to improve the uh, the yield on the production of rice. Right? They wanted to get more rice in this plot of land. I don't know whether it was one acre or ten hectare. I don't know. But this, the, the principle still applies. So how can they get a better crop yield? Well, they could pour more fertiliser onto it and they could pour more in- insecticides to kill the insects and do all those nasty things, right? What did they do? Beautifully simple. Someone I don't know came up with this idea and said, why don't we introduce ducks to this area where we are growing rice? Again, I'm not, I don't have the figures. I, they're probably on the internet somewhere. But what they did was to produ- introduce ducklings into this area where they were growing rice. Ducks like water, right? So what did the ducklings do? They grew and they ate the insects that were coming in to attack the rice. Okay? What else were they doing while they were eating this? Yeah, they were fertilising the, 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 the area. Oh, fertilising, yeah. <laughs> and when it came time to harvest the rice, there was a 20% increase in production of wow. rice. And wow. as I say when I'm telling this story, what else is another outcome? That, what else did they get? Fat ducks. <laughs> right? Absolutely. This is such a simple way of making an improvement. And we often miss how the, some of the simple strategies to make a difference in what we're doing. We complicate things. Now, not everybody's growing rice, I'm sure, but I want you to think of that as an analogy, as an example of how costs can be saved, how productivity can be improved, how we can get better results. We're not all making iPhones but we are all in a situation where we can make a difference in the organisation that we are at. Phoebe, let me just come back finally to one to a bank story, which I'm very much aware of. You and I know about these situations because of the work that we've done in the banking industry. But here was a situation where some middle-level people that I was working with in, the, in one bank in the Middle East came up with an idea to make some changes in the processes and procedures that are that were a normal kind of banking operation, of which there are many, 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 many procedures to do. 
Now, it is obvious that the central bank has some input into some of these procedures, right? The central bank says, no, no, you can't do that. You've got to do this. But I, I said to these guys, at some stage, there will be a discussion because of what they were talking about. There will be a discussion with the central bank and the central bank will change, possibly. Have you ever asked what they did in one, what one woman did in one particular case? was to reduce a procedure that, or a process that had been in the bank for some years that took three days and sometimes up to three weeks, and mm. she brought that down to two hours. Whoa. She said, why don't we do this and this and this, two hours instead of up to sometimes three weeks. We are living in a world of constant change, and leaders at all levels should be embracing that and encouraging others to do this as well. Mohammed, I can see a serious look on your face. Yeah, big. Uh, yeah, uh, see, uh, from banking to safety, which is something um, imposed, let us say, by uh, legal uh, bodies in every country. You cannot actually operate without safety rules, but safety has also uh, an an economic and moral uh, origin rather than just legal. So here's the thing. Um, my point is sometimes uh, the change is inevitable and it's forced. I mean, you have no way. You, your organization, the changes in the uh, in the governmental uh, guidelines, etc. That you have no uh, choice but to apply them. This is where it becomes tricky. Sometimes the other party doesn't see the benefit in that, and yet all of us have to go through it. And there are very uh, delicate and smooth and specific mechanisms we need to use to all of us embark and migrate to the new change. Sometimes we bring in catalysts from outside just because they are more compelling or something like that, which brought me into organizations in the Gulf just as a catalyst of change. I'm not creating it, but helping the uh, a specific layer of the employees just get over it and embrace and buy in. So this this is happening a lot around in the region, everywhere, I'm sure. Yeah, and you know, the 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 factor is this is people's lives, right? What you're dealing with mm -hmm. is the lives of our colleagues and ourselves that are going to be impacted in in this situation. But I understand that it's all very well to have rules and and regulations and processes and procedures in that safety area, but there are improvements in the way things are being done. And yes, right. And we can still save lives and we can still prevent injury by doing slightly different. Yeah, absolutely. I think, I think one aspect which, which can be a simple act is, you know, uh, do something each day <laughs> so that you are better than you were the day before, you know. Uh, yeah, so yeah, yeah. That, 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 uh, that, that simple act can make a huge difference quite often i think as uh, facilitators and uh, uh, people who try to develop people we see that there is a lack of knowledge in some people because they are conditioned by previous practices so that is where as facilitators we can bring that uh, curiosity like that that thought process always asking what is new what is next yeah. What is better? Yeah. What if? What if? You know, here's another example. I was doing doing a program for you know, 10 years ago for, uh, not quite 10 years ago, for a, a telecommunications company. I won't mention names, but a large telecommunications company in Africa. And I said to them, how do you make your money? And they looked at me as if that was a stupid question. We sell time you know, time on, on the service, the time for you to make a phone call, that's what we sell to our customers. That's how we make our money. I said, okay, what if you didn't do that? What? My children would starve. <laughs> I wouldn't make any money. <laughs> we have to do this. It's, well, I said, hey, well, what if you didn't charge them? Oh, I said, what, what could you do? Oh, well, we could we could just bill them for an extra amount for the, the handset that they're using, the, the, the phone. No, that's not what I have in mind. What else could you do? 
oh, 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 they were trying, but they still weren't quite getting it. And the next time that I came, I said, I want you to think about this. I want you to, I'm going to challenge. Don't just accept the fact that we've got to do this by selling people time. There's got to be another way. When I came back to see these people about a month later, I had, maybe a bit longer, I had heard of another company in Africa that was doing what I had in my mind, that I was trying to get them to think about. And I didn't give them this in that first session that I was with them, but I was trying to get them to think about how could we make money legitimately <laughs> and survive without charging people for the phone call. And I, and that was what I was trying to get them to think about, the process of thinking, what, what, okay, what? But I heard of a company in Africa, I don't know whether it's still happening, that what they were doing was going to large companies and saying to these large companies, would you like to advertise your product? Oh, yes, probably we would. Okay, pay us X whatever. I don't know how they did the sums. And we will put onto our phone line a recorded advertisement of maybe 15 seconds long, I don't know, maybe a bit more, advertising your product. And every time someone goes to use their phone to make a phone call, they will not pay for that time, but they will listen to your advertisement selling your product. So what they, the, the, my, my proposal was that we're getting someone else, a company, to get value for them by paying for the advertising. But look, whether I don't know whether it was successful with this company or not, but my point is we should be thinking of things like this. Everybody in the world is ch we're changing. Why don't we have something called internet? Yeah, to, me, yeah, to me, more important than the result is actually getting people to think. The Absolutely. process of challenging the process. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And I think so many organisations are conditioned. And look, if ever any anybody in the organisation says, but we've always done it that way, leave the organisation immediately if you can't get them to change because we can't stay in the a context of we've always done it that way. If, if we always did it that way, we'd still be guzzling fuel. We wouldn't be having electric vehicles. If we always did it that way, we wouldn't have emails. If we always did it that way, we wouldn't have electronic banks. You know, all of those things. Someone along the way has said, is there a better way? And I want everybody in every organisation to say to their managers, is there a better way? And this is, I'm going to slow down in a minute, because when I get on this thing about challenge the process, like obviously you can see I get fired up. But I want managers who are listening and watching us now, leaders, when you're having a weekly or monthly team meeting, say to the members in the team who are there, when we next come together. I want each of you to have a suggestion, small or large, as to how we can make improvements to the way we are doing things. Absolutely, because when you do that, yeah. the people, yeah, yeah, the people who have ideas will not actually refrain and won't be afraid. You yeah. have no idea how many of them already wishes to uh, suggest a change, but they are reluctant. The moment you say, as a leader, is there a better way? I want you to come with up, come up with new ideas. You are actually giving the permission, and that's that's what a leader does. This is one. I think this will make this my last story for today. I, I'm on a bit of a roll, but I was working with a, a company some years ago. Uh, they were in uh, Oman, and I caught up with the general manager of one particular company in the group who had been on the Leadership Challenge program a, a year before. And I said, so what's happened in terms of your uh, productivity and in sales and what, what changes have happened? And he said, as a result of the workshop, Graham, what you suggested, and I'll come to that specifically in a moment, he said, we, this company that he was general manager of, have made an extra $2 million profit in the last 12 months. I said, prove it. Don't just say it, show me how. So he described to me what they were producing. I'm not going to be specific about, oh, I can be specific, I guess. They were producing bottled water. He said, I make water. 
they were producing bottled water. And on one of the production lines for the water, he, he's able to say we were making X bottles of water, a, 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 all of those things. He knew the ma- metrics of this. And he challenged the team on the production line. The people who were on the production line in the factory producing the water every day. Is there a better way of doing this? What can we do? So he then said to me, I have reduced the shift. We have reduced the shift turnover each day from two hours to one hour because of the changes that were put in place. I said, how many people are involved in the shift change? And he said, 30 people. So multiply that by the number. So that's 30 people every day are gaining an hour five days a week, do the quick math, that's 150 hours of extra productivity a week. He had. He said there were other things that they did also that increased the productivity. I said, but where does this $2 million come from? He gave me the numbers. He said, we've actually, this was the cost of producing the bottle of water. This was the number of bottles that we produced extra. And this is the sales price. And I said, so they're sitting in a factory somewhere? <laughs> and he said, no, we sold them all. Two million dollars <laughs> profit. I didn't get a commission. But all of this because he said to the people on the production line, not him, he didn't bring management consultants in and say, can you improve our productivity? He had, you said, Muhammad, it's the people on the production line who may have ideas, but they're afraid to voice those ideas. And he encouraged them and made an extra $2 million a year. Absolutely, yeah. Amazing what our people can do if, we, if they just believe in challenging the process. And what leaders can do to encourage them. Phoebe, you're, you're over to you. I've said enough. Yeah, thank you, Graham. So, you, you know, you, you, you mentioned one word, which, which I, um, the word afraid, you know. And and that is where quite often the organization gets stuck in the rut. Yeah. You know, the opportunity for people to bring in the diverse perspective is often yeah. missing. And quite often leaders are afraid, how can I do that? And they, they they may they may require some guidance in that process. And because of that, that specific stuckness, many organizations are unable to grow. They they are challenged. And people people feel frustrated. The culture become uh, of you, you know of anxiety in the in the process. So I, I think uh, if if we can ask this simple question, as Graham you mentioned, what if what if we do things like this? What if we get an experimental idea? What what will be the result? Yeah. And and that if if uh, you are opening it to the diverse voices, you you can see unique ideas emerging like like imagine three of us like uh, our experiences are different and our environments were different and each of us bring a unique strength which actually help uh, to open our own ideas as well as our own mindset so that's what i just want to highlight at this point yeah. ask yeah. the question what if yeah mohammed yeah, I'm very much um, inspired by the what if and uh, is there a better way? And um, I believe that uh, on every scale, we can start this immediately. Yeah. Uh, even even the medium with which we are using now in order to send a message across. Actually, it was someone uh, who has challenged the process and now we are benefiting from that. Imagine a world where uh, everybody is benefiting from uh, just disembarking from old ideas and embarking on new ones. And that also applies to climate change and what is happening there, the, the, the developments that are happening that are going to make a significant difference to the way we live our lives. So, the, But this challenge should be within everybody, every organisation looking for better ways to do things. Gentlemen, I thank you. Our time is up. And for everybody else who's with us now, let me tell you about what we're going to be talking about next week. Are you interested? We are going to be talking about next week, we're going to be talking about the power of relationships. 
how does that work with us, right? We know relationships are critical as leaders, and it's something that I want to spend time with talking with you, hearing other people's comments about this as well. So for people who are watching us now, please join us next week for the power of leadership. And by the way, please re become a subscriber and you'll be kept up to date on all the recordings and information that we are giving to you to help you become a better leader. Is that right, Mohammed? Absolutely. Hit that button. Hit that button. Subscribe. Bibi, do you agree? I agree. And I, I, I am uh, throwing out a challenge to our viewers. Oh, good. What? <laughs> yeah, so the question to them is, what way we can be better? Throw yeah. your ideas. Yeah. Share it in your comments. We are here. And challenge us. Yeah, really good. Really good. So that's the thing. The email address is on the it's on the, the, the channel uh, page. If you've got some ideas on how we can make some do things differently or what you would like to hear from us, please let us know and we will look to do that. We're here to help, aren't we? Yes. yes. Absolutely. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Thank you, everybody who's been with us today and we'll be back again next week to talk about the power of relationships.